science. But the search for proof of extraterrestrial intelligence has produced disappointing results. The best so-called evidence has only been a few photographs and film clips. But now, all that's about to change. Since 1985, more than 15 million Americans have reportedly witnessed unidentified flying objects. But despite the seemingly overwhelming evidence, mainstream science has chosen to ignore the subject. But now, for the first time in history, one of the greatest mysteries of this century is unraveling. A former government scientist has come forward to discuss the military's classified work on extraterrestrial spacecraft. The end of World War II and the invention of the atomic bomb signaled a new era of international mistrust. Since the earliest days of the Cold War, which coincides with the Roswell incident and the start of the modern UFO era, the military has been especially secretive about its advances and achievements while always searching for the perfect weapon or super sophisticated tool of espionage. High-tech surveillance equipment around the world and even in space has allowed global intelligence to see and be aware of many things that the common civilian cannot even begin to imagine. The military recruits many talented civilians when special expertise is required. And propulsion systems expert Bob Lazar claims he was one of them. In this exclusive interview, he gives his detailed account of his employment with the Department of Naval Intelligence at the top secret facility known as S-4 where, according to Bob, he was hired to work on recovered alien spacecraft. This now not-so-secret military base at Groom Lake, Nevada, is known as Area 51, or Dreamland, as insiders like to call it. Born in 1959 in Coral Gables, Florida, Bob has lived much of his life in Las Vegas, Nevada. With degrees in physics and electronics from MIT and Caltech, he has dabbled in everything from chemistry to fireworks in an effort to understand the finer points of propulsion. He has even assembled a jet car with a 22,000 horsepower engine salvaged from a Navy F3D Sky Knight that is capable of land speeds of over 350 miles per hour. Fate took a serious turn for Bob in 1982. Arriving early for a lecture at Los Alamos National Laboratory in New Mexico given by Dr. Edward Teller, one of the inventors of the atomic bomb, Bob was able to meet and talk to the famous physicist. Coincidentally, Dr. Teller was reading the local paper, The Monitor, with a featured front page article on Bob, and the two struck up a conversation. Later, Bob sent Dr. Teller his resume for consideration, and soon after, Bob was hired by the Los Alamos National Laboratory. This Los Alamos-based directory lists Bob as an employee. By 1989, Bob was brought into the top secret program at S4, known as Project Galileo. In the following interview, Bob reveals many details of this amazing experience. Did you witness any disk technology at Area 51? No, there was no, absolutely no ET craft, ET technology, anything like that at Area 51. This is why S4 was made specifically to separate it there. People at Area 51 do not have the clearance. How long were you employed at S4, and when were you hired? When was I hired at S4? I guess early 89, and I was probably there only about six months or so, uh, on a very infrequent basis. How were you transported to and from work? At the time that I was working there at uh, McCarran International Airport in Las Vegas, there was a special projects EG&G building. When I was told to go to work, I drove there, parked my car there, uh, and got in a plane at the airport, flew to Groom Lake, where I deplaned and waited for a bus, and the bus drove me down to uh, S4. The S4 facility is an area just off the Papoose Lake bed, dry lake bed, and it consists of nine hangars, the hangars have uh, sloped doors on them with a sand texture coating. 
around the opposite end of the hangars. There's the standard entrance where you're dropped off at, you go through a security check, and inside there's a small complex. Uh, there is some office space, there are several laboratories, the hangars themselves, of course, and uh, a few other places. I didn't have free reign to go wherever I wanted to. Everywhere I went to, I was essentially escorted, so uh, that was really all about that uh, I saw. Inside the facility, what was the basic layout? Were there underground levels? I don't think there were any underground levels to it, though there, there could have been. I, I don't think it was, uh, you know, an extensive underground facility. It just looked like uh, an installation that was butt up against a mountain. And, uh, you know, I didn't see any evidence of any stairs going down, elevators, or... Uh, but, like I said, I don't know. There could have been, and I just might not have been permitted in those areas. It's difficult to, uh, to really surmise how long it had been operational. Everything did look fairly new. Uh, by that I mean I don't think this installation was there in the early 70s. Uh, nothing was worn. Uh, things looked fairly freshly painted. So, uh, you know, a as a ballpark guess, I would say it would, it would really surprise me if the installation was older than five, seven, ten years, something like that. His burden made us killed in the project. What exactly happened there? Allegedly, obviously, I, I didn't see this, and I don't know it to be fact, but this is what I was told, that I was hired uh, to replace one of a couple people that were killed uh, while working on one of the reactors from one of the crafts. Apparently, they, for whatever reason, cut open an operating reactor, and the device exploded, killing both of them. The scientists that were killed there, uh, allegedly the detonation from the explosion was fairly large. Uh, it would have rivaled a small tactical nuke. So it was done at the Nevada test site, and it was to be passed off as an un unannounced nuclear, nuclear test. Did you have any direct contact or communication with aliens? No, not at all. Tell us about the briefing files. Under what conditions did you gain access to them? I was put into the briefing room with uh, 121 or 22 briefings and really was just told to sit and read through them. I think they were there just to mainly educate me on, on what was going on. They weren't a complete in-depth in explanation on everything else, but just uh, essentially a brief synopsis on some of the other projects that were going on there. Supposedly, the information, now this isn't something that I determined, it's something I was told, that uh, the crafts originated from uh, a planet that orbited the Zeta Reticuli star system, Zeta Reticuli 1 and Zeta Reticuli 2 are two, two stars of a binary star system. Uh, the craft allegedly came from there. One or two autopsy photographs I saw uh, dealt with just a small photograph, a bus shot essentially, just head, shoulders and chest of an alien with a uh, uh, chest was cut open in T-fashion and one single organ was removed. Uh, the organ itself in the, in the other picture was uh, cut and vivisectioned, essentially, the, uh, showing the different chambers in there. Uh, this was totally unrelated to anything I was doing, but from that photograph, it looked like you know, what you see in UFO lore as the typical gray. So how tall it was from what I could see, I, I couldn't tell, because I only saw a portion of the photograph. But if everything else you see is correct, I would imagine it was three and a half or four feet tall but uh, there again you know all I had to see was a photograph and you know I didn't have much to go on what was the incident in 1979 that brought the alien exchange program of information to a halt again this is a story that was relayed to me and uh, allegedly what happened in 79 there was some sort of information exchange going on where there were actual live aliens at the facility and at one particular point there was an area where some security personnel went to enter and apparently because of not the sidearms but the bullets in the sidearms from what I understand if they would have entered the area the bullets would have detonated uh, and 
supposedly one of the creatures tried to stop the security personnel from entering the area and a fight ensued and the bottom line from the altercation was that the uh, security personnel I don't remember how many were involved but were all killed and they died of head wounds and that's all that all that I heard of that story what was your job description at S4 my official job description was a senior staff physicist uh, I don't know if I actually had that position when I was there because I was there so infrequently I wasn't supervising anyone so I uh, that, that was the official position I was hired under but uh, whether or not I actually acted in that capacity I don't know what was the size of the staff working on Project Galileo well there were 22 people employed there totally and that was specifically for the Galileo project no for the entire project oh, I see. there were 22 people with majestic clearance I had Majestic Clearance. Majestic Clearance was designated as uh, clearance 38 levels above Q Clearance, and Q Clearance is the civilian uh, top secret clearance. When did you see your first disc? The first disc I saw, I believe it was the second, or I think it was the third time I was up there. Uh, normally the bus pulled around to the opposite end of the facility, which was the main entrance, and that's where we went in. On um, this particular occasion, it pulled up to one of the hangar doors, which were normally closed, and the, the last one was open. We came out, and I saw the disc in the hangar. Uh, upon seeing it, it, it struck me that, well, this explains all the UFO sightings. Not thinking that it was an extraterrestrial craft, that this must have been some advanced form of fighter that we've been working on for years, and, you know, people have just caught it being tested, so on and so forth. And... Uh, it never even occurred to me, even though I was looking at an extraterrestrial vehicle, that, you know, this wasn't man-made. When did you realize the craft was not of earthly origin? Well, it probably really hit me when I got inside the craft and looked around and began to understand how the craft was operated and finally grasped the whole project as a whole as what we were doing the fact that we weren't building this thing we were trying to find out how it was made we were back engineering it what is back engineering well back engineering is taking a finished product and finding out how the device or product was produced and essentially determining whether or not you can duplicate it. Now, scientists aside, what was your emotional response? What were you thinking were the implications to the world or man in general from these revelations? I really didn't think about implications of, of, of that sort. As far as emotionally, uh, people have asserted that, boy, that must have been the most exciting time in your life, and I, that's not the way it was when I first got to look inside the craft, the, the, all I can say, it's an ominous feeling. You walk in there and uh, it's, it feels as if you shouldn't be there. I know that sounds kind of corny, but it's a real ominous feeling. It's not an exciting feeling. Uh, it brings up a whole lot of questions in your mind. Well, where did this come from? And you know that they won't give you the answers to the whole story, but it's, uh, um, that's the only way I can describe it. Let's go, people! Keep lift. It produces a gravity wave, which is similar to the gravity wave that the Earth produces. However, the craft phase shifts the wave. In other words, it, it turns the wave, not really in an opposite polarity, but something to that effect, where it will work against the natural gravity wave of the Earth, and it produces lift in, in that effect. Is there any internal protection for the crew, does the craft generate a, a, a gravitational field inside the craft itself? Well, the craft generates its own gravitational field. Being inside that field essentially doesn't shield you, but it, essentially you're in, <laughs> and this is a, a terrible way to say it, almost in a different realm, because you're you're now influenced only that by that gravitational field. For instance, people wonder how 
a craft like this can make a turn at such high speed, a 90 degree turn, when they would imagine people slamming up against the wall or something to that effect. Well, that, that really wouldn't happen. Inertia would have no effect. Uh, you're, you're in a distortion. And don't forget that gravity distorts time and space. So really nothing is going to influence you while you're in there. Describe the gravity amplifiers for us and some of their different operating configurations. There are three amplifiers. The craft can operate on a single one, can lift off the ground. The way in which it's propelled are two different ways. There's what they call Omicron configuration, where the craft is using one generator, uh, or a delta configuration, where it's use utilizing all three. Delta configuration would be for space travel. Essentially, the craft will tilt up on its side, as opposed to a science fiction mover where you see a flying saucer moving around. The craft will tilt up on its side, focus the three gravity generators to a single point, and move through space that way. Moving around the source of gravity is a problem to a disk because it's interference, essentially. So what they do is they work with that interference to their benefit. They'll use one gravity generator to lift the craft off the ground. And as opposed to what we're used to, for instance, a plane, once it's in the air, we envision thrust or some force coming out the back of it to push it forward. The crafts work completely opposite of that. What they do is once they're hovering in the air, they'll swing the gravity, two remaining gravity generators up in front of them and create a distortion, essentially a downhill. And the craft rolls downhill for infinity. It's always chasing a little distortion. That's why they look goofy when they fly around at low speed, because they're essentially, and any time you run over, you know, the gravity field around the Earth is not completely constant and stable, depending on the minerals and density of the Earth underneath it. The gravity will vary somewhat, and you will get odd movements of the craft. So its low speed mode is, is kind of unstable for the most part. I only witnessed one test flight up close, officially. Uh, that I was in, just inside the hangar. Uh, the test was going off probably, you know, uh, just as the sun was going down. And it was a, a low performance test. I believe there were uh, some pilots or test pilots in the craft. The craft must have been retrofitted to fit them because the seating arrangements were really not accommodating. Um, they were in radio communication with the craft, which is kind of surprising to me because the gravity waves that the craft was producing should have uh, distorted the radio waves also. So uh, apparently there's something there that I don't understand. Um, the craft lifted off the ground, uh, virtually noiseless, other than a small corona discharge on the bottom of the craft, indicating the presence of high voltage. Uh, that dissipated at about 30 feet, and it stood there completely silently and moved over to the left, to the right, and sat back down. That was the entire uh, test. However, that was an extremely impressive test. Uh, maybe to someone that really knows little about science or anything, that, that wouldn't be a whole lot. But you have to realize this craft was about 52 feet in diameter. I don't know exactly how much it weighed, but it weighed a lot. And uh, this was quite, quite a scientific feat, to lift something completely silently under control and, uh, you know, perform a maneuver like that. The craft itself was, uh, I assume it was metal. It was cold to the touch. That's why I say it was metal. But it was a uh, brushed aluminum, actually just an unfinished stainless steel, not shiny uh, finish to it. Had no seams. It was as if it was injection molded from one giant die. I was completely amazed. I, I can't really reflect on how it made me feel, but it, that was exciting. How would you define gravity? Could you describe in layman's terms its basic principles for us? Gravity is something difficult to explain because it's something that we essentially don't understand. It's just something that we can observe. Not much is really known about gravity. Uh, there are many theories about it, but they are just mainly theories. There's theories of gravitons. 
which allege that there these are these subatomic particles that, that act like an attractive force like gravity that exchange between two pieces of matter. There is also a theory that gravity is uh, a form of wave, an electromagnetic wave. Uh, but basically, gravity is a force. It's, uh, it, it's the attraction. It, well, it's the inherent property of matter to have gravity, a mutual attraction for each other. And that's it, it's basically all that we really know. Modern science, current science right now, identifies one gravity. It's one force in nature. Uh, apparently, through research at S4 or information gained from one of the crafts they were researching there, uh, it, it appears that there are two different forms of gravity. One form works on an atomic scale on subatomic particles, holding pieces of matter, holding atoms themselves together. Uh, another works on a larger scale, the scale we're most, most familiar with uh, holding planets in orbit, holding ourselves to the ground, things of that sort. Because it produces a gravitational field, it, I, I wouldn't say the craft is invisible during the day. However, if you're under the craft, because of the way the gravity is being used, gravity bends time and space and it, it bends light. If you are looking underneath the craft or from certain vantage points, you will actually see what's above the craft. It's, a, it's really a trick of the way light bends under the influence of gravity. For instance, we can see stars that are behind the sun, that are blocked from our view by the sun. The reason we can see them is because the sun is a tremendous gravitational field and it's bending the light around it where we can see the star. Space, time, and gravity are all essentially interrelated. They all act on one another. Gravity bends space. Gravity also distorts time. When you vary one, you essentially vary the other two. Uh, if you, as an example, if you have a massive body, say a planet or, or something that's making a lot of gravity, producing a lot of gravitational waves, if you will, um, it distorts space. It bends space to it. It also slows down time. These things aren't theories. We know them to be true. Uh, we cannot artificially create this because we can't create gravity. Uh, but this is how they're all interrelated. His burden made him with traveling at the speed of light. There are several problems traveling at the speed of light. Uh, just a couple of them are the fact that as your speed increases, so does your mass proportionally. Uh, in other words, the more energy you put in to go faster, begins to slow you down by the fact that it's converted into mass. Um, you have other problems like just traveling at such an extreme velocity, navigational problems, the fact that you might run into little tiny micrometeorites uh, at, at speeds like this, they would undoubtedly destroy your craft. There's just a, a, a whole host of problems that you're going to run into. Uh, just attempting to do something like that. Aside from the fact the amount of energy required to accelerate to the speed of light is uh, horrendous. Could you briefly describe Project Looking Glass and Project Sidekick for us? Project Sidekick was another project going on uh, with Galileo. Galileo was the project that I was involved in. Sidekick dealt with any of the weapon potential of the craft, whether or not the craft had a weapon in it or could it be used as a weapon, but it had something to do with some sort of particle beam uh, configuration where the gravity generator can be used as a lens to focus, focus a weapon of some sort, similar to the SDI device we were working on in the, uh, the 80s, but with the potential of a focusing device using the uh, gravity generator. And Project Looking Glass? Project Looking Glass dealt with the distortion, the fact that there's a time distortion. Essentially, looking back in time, and by that I do not mean looking back years ago to see the wagon train days. They're looking for distortions that are milliseconds in time. And what, what that was used for, I, I don't know. But that was uh, just observing the time, the, you know, the time distortion, time dilation phenomena, the craft in operation. What is element 115? Is it found here on Earth, or is it strictly an extraterrestrial material? 115 is strictly an extraterrestrial material. Uh, it probably occurs naturally in some other places, 
maybe other star systems. Uh, you know, some people not familiar with science or chemistry say, well, that's ridiculous. All the elements occur on Earth, you know. Uh, but that's not true. There are elements on the periodic chart that aren't found on Earth. I believe the heavy ion research lab in Darmstadt, Germany, uh, has reached element 112 recently. So 115 isn't, isn't that far away. And when they synthesize it, it's not like they're making a, a couple ounces of it. They're talking about one or two atoms of it. To make any usable quantity of a heavy element like that is virtually impossible. Element 115 is in the top of the reactor. And the base of the reactor apparently is a small, something similar to a cyclotron. It's a particle accelerator. Uh, a particle is accelerated to high speed and then deflected up a small tube, and it's aimed at the 115. This transmutes the 115, uh, similar to the way we, we do that in a normal particle accelerator. Uh, this causes a, a reaction, a radiation emission that we really haven't seen before. Um, it produces antimatter. This antimatter is guided down a tuned tube and reacts with a gas. When matter and antimatter react, they convert to 100% energy. This energy is converted, heat energy, is converted to electrical power in the reactor itself. This is done through a, a thermoelectric converter. And this electrical power is used to power other subsystems on the craft, though there is no wiring, you know, as we would know it. Uh, also, that's almost a byproduct of the reactor. The reactor also sets up a gravitational wave from the 115 being bombarded. This gravitational wave was present at the top of the reactor and is essentially guided in the same way microwaves are guided, through tuned tubes. And uh, this goes to their amplifying cavities and through the projectors that are in the bottom of the craft. With the gravity generators running, is there thermal radiation danger to the crew? There is no thermal radiation while the reactor is running. The thermionic generator is 100% efficient, which is in violation of the first law of thermodynamics. But in fact, it works. Element 115 is stable. And for those familiar with chemistry, we know that uh, elements with higher atomic numbers have shorter and shorter half-lives. Um, however, when you reach a certain point, they call it the island of stability. There is a place, and we've theorized this for a long time, somewhere around 114 to 116, there should be an area in there where the nucleus of the atom is geometrically stable with protons and neutrons, where it, it no longer decays. It's not radioactive. 115 is, in fact, this element. In fact, it does occur again, somewhere around element 247. Uh, of course, you know, we're nowhere near synthesizing that. And we can only you know, predict things like that. But uh, that's, that's where 115 is. Did they, the aliens, give us element 115 in large quantities? Whether or not it was given to us I, I can't answer that question. However, I was told that we have 500 pounds by one of my coworkers. Uh, how it was obtained and you know where exactly it came from, I don't know. Whether it came in one of the crafts or you know it was separate cargo somewhere, you know, anyone can speculate. But I was I was told that was the the figure. You were able to get away with a sample of Element 115. How much did you get away with? No comment. Several nighttime test flights, unofficially, while off the base. What did you see? The test flights I saw off the base, actually the, the best test flight was witnessed by my friends, who I had brought out there. I, at the uh, exact moment the craft was hopping around and doing some really impressive maneuvers, I had turned around and I think was uh, looking for the video camera or, or something to that effect. But I missed some of the most... Uh, impressive maneuvers but the craft was uh, similar to what was done before that I had seen close up other than the fact that it went above the mountain range uh, moved a, a much greater distance at a much higher rate of speed how are you able to find out about the test flight schedules the test flight schedules were told to me 
specifically because I was probably going to have to be present during those times. And at that time, the test flights were taking place on Wednesday nights. And from what they said, that was because that was uh, statistically the least amount of traffic in the area. And that's uh, all that they were concerned about. Does the propulsion system release any sort of discharge or exhaust? There was a high voltage discharge on the bottom of the craft, but uh, as far as there being an exhaust, there was none. Why did they appear as glowing balls of light in the night sky? Well, that's kind of the same reason why a neon light or a fluorescent light lights up. What you're dealing with, with is a high energy source in essentially a gas atmosphere, oxygen, nitrogen. And uh, when you apply enough energy to a gas molecule, they emit photons, they emit light. And uh, I don't think it's anything, it, it's a really a byproduct of how the craft operates. When it's a, emitting that much energy, the gas surrounding the craft emits light. The same reason why lightning is visible. They have a huge electrical discharge, and the gas emits light in the form of lightning bolt. If you were going to see one of these crafts at night operating, it would appear really as a glowing ball or a, just a bright light in the sky from a distance. Uh, even close up, you know, you'd see a, a glowing halo around it. Uh, this is typically what you'd see in your normal UFO sighting, uh, if you've heard them a lot. However, keep in mind that lights in the sky are caused by much more common things than flying saucers. Tell us a little more about the aurora you witnessed taking off out of Area 51. It was a large craft, and the one glimpse I got of it was from the rear, and it had two huge square exhausts with vanes in them. And uh, it was just, it sounded more like a rocket than a jet. I don't know. I even think he did mention that it was liquid methane powered, but um, there again, you know, working on the disk technology, I really could care less what was rolling around at Area 51, but uh, it, it, it did catch my eye. As a result of going public, have there been any attempts made on your life? One day when I was getting on um, Interstate 15, driving down Charleston Boulevard, uh, a car came up alongside of me, and uh, I thought he was just trying to race me to get on the freeway. Uh, this was after I had left the project. Um, it was a white, boxy-looking car, exactly what make and model, I don't know. But um, I accelerated to get on the freeway to go fast, and there was a gunshot, and the back of the car was hit, and I skidded off into the uh, median. And I stopped, and I was frightened, and I just stood there because I thought the guy was going to be alongside of me and just shoot me. I had nothing to do. I was essentially paralyzed with with fear and I waited there and then nothing else happened and do I know it was a government agent trying to kill me no could it have been a drive-by shooting maybe uh, you know so wasn't it I mean it was an attempt on my life but by who specifically I, I don't know though I was threatened uh, before I had left that they threatened my wife's life and my life so I can only put two and two together and say that they were kind of pissed at me in an earlier interview, you had mentioned that they had put a gun to your head. Tell us about that. That was after we were caught out when I had the test flight schedule, and uh, I brought some friends out to show them the disc test. Uh, we got caught out there, and the following day, I was debriefed down at Indian Springs Air Force Base. and. Um, I was in the room with the security guards that caught us, my supervisor and some other people and uh, some of the security personnel. Uh, yeah, they were essentially grilling me about security and, you know, how could I possibly bring people out there and uh, I guess I wasn't as responsive as they would like and they got in my face and one of them pulled the sidearm out and you know, just pushed it against me. Have you maintained any contacts with your colleagues out at S4? No, I never heard from anyone other than for a very brief time after I left, Dennis, who was my supervisor, did try and make contact with me at the, uh, the meeting place was the Union Plaza Hotel. 
And I took a, a friend of mine, Gene Huff, down there, and another friend, uh, a former colleague and scientist from Los Alamos. And we did, uh, we saw him, but I also did recognize some security personnel walking around there from S4. So whether or not it was a setup or what was going on or he was trying to talk to me, we never found out and we left. It just was a, a real strange situation. I never heard from him since. As we enter the 21st century, how has your experience changed your beliefs? Well, if you want to word the question, how are my opinions changed? Uh, I would say considerably. And before I was at S4, I was more or less one of the uh, one of the guys that thought, you know, all these government conspiracy and UFO buffs and things like that were complete lunatics. Um, I even remember before I was involved there, a friend showed me a little newspaper clipping and said John Lear was giving a lecture who was uh, touting that aliens from another world came to Earth and there's 70 different species. And I remember laughing on the phone that this guy had lost his mind. And uh, I was also under the impression that, you know, boy, the government's all for the people and they, you know, you know, they're out here to protect us and all that. You know, after the experiences I had there, uh, everything is completely turned around. You know, the, the government <laughs> is doing everything but uh, looking out for us. I mean, the only thing they're looking at is for themselves. You know, uh, obviously the ET craft do exist. Something had to build them, so there must be aliens. And since there are and the craft are there, there must be some sort of factory and an entire civilization somewhere. And if in fact that is true, and it apparently is, then there must be others crafts and technology from another world and uh, that's probably the most important event in history. It kind of moved from science fiction into reality in my mind and uh, it really just I guess opened my eyes. Let's go! Whether or not we can duplicate them. I mean, if we can understand what a device is or how something operates or what its physical makeup is that's great but if we can't duplicate it it's useless to us. So there's really two phases to the project going on there. It's understanding what we're looking at. And then once we understand it is can we duplicate it with earthly materials and earthly technology? And you know, unless we've got a handle on both of them, all that technology is useless to us. And, and if it turns out we can't do that, all we have is one single prized possession that we have to take care of. And that's it. After all that's been said and done, would you do this over again? What would you do differently? I would probably have played along for a longer time. Um, I would like to have known a little bit more about the technology and uh, probably kept quiet if I could have. Um, and possibly never have said anything. Uh, I almost wish I had done that, you know, it, it's, uh, <laughs> it's really only caused headaches and problems, but um, I believe if I was given the opportunity again to go back in time and redo it, I think I pretty much would have just shut up and gone along with the program. I would have much preferred that instead of the Navy or whoever it was, uh, that hand-picked a few renegade scientists here and there, that they turn it over to some more qualified people. Obviously, I was not the most qualified person on a propulsion or field propulsor or anything of that sort. I was just some guy. I mean, they could have picked, I could have named 10 or 12 other guys that were more qualified than me. But, um, you know, if they turned it over to the scientific community and not just a couple guys here in the United States, I mean, you need a large group of people in a large lab to research what's going on there. Uh, not a little quiet installation. It's the, it's the, security itself that prevents them from getting anywhere. I mean, it, it, they never do work hand in hand. You can't have a, a military mind. Science itself must communicate. You have to have a free exchange of ideas. That's how things progress. And when you clamp down on a security system like that, where you work in isolated groups, and ideas cannot be exchanged, you don't get anywhere, and that's, that's the problem they have.
What does the future hold for Bob Lazar? Well, I'm not really involved in any of that stuff anymore. That's kind of put behind me. Um, I have my own businesses that I work at, uh, some computer graphics, uh, some consultation, um, other technical jobs, uh, radiation detectors, and a few other things like that. Um, so really, I just go about my life, and that's you know something that happened that was fantastic, and, and it's over, but uh, it's kind of hard to shake it loose. But eventually I will, and that'll be that. I think all the surveillance and everything stopped. I don't think anyone's bothering to monitor me. I've, I've said everything that I know. It's been all over the place, so it's kind of uh, a done deal. As far as whether or not there are any craft out there, I believe you know they were out and gone in probably the late 89, early 90. And the only thing people see now out there are you know, either flares or planes coming into land. But uh, that's about it. Did you have an interest in flying saucers or science fiction in general as a child? I was never interested in flying saucers as a child. Science fiction, you know, I watched Star Trek, I guess, with everyone else back then. But uh, for the most part, yeah, I didn't even believe in flying saucers up until I was employed at S4. I couldn't help at one point in my discussions with, privately with General Secretary Gorbachev, when you stop to think that we're all God's children, wherever we may live in the world, I couldn't help but say to him, just think how easy his task and mine might be in these meetings that we held if suddenly there was a threat to this world from some other species from another planet uh, outside in the universe we'd forget all the little local differences that we have between our countries and we would find out once and for all that we really are all human beings here on this earth together Well. I don't suppose we can wait for some alien race to come down and threaten us, but I think that between us, we can bring about that realization. Thank you all. God bless you all.